and the grandson. Now, if you are a, a believer in the biological perspective of criminal justice, that actually supports what the bio biological aspect actually teaches. Okay? So first of all, we're going to talk about what are crime variables. Okay? A crime variable, as you can see, is a characteristic, a number, or a quantity that increases or decreases. I mean, bring this down a little bit for you guys. I want to make sure you can see the everything here. Okay? Which increases or decreases over time or takes different uh, values in different situations. We believe as criminologists that at the age of 40 years old or somewhere around 38, 39, 40 years old, people begin to age out of crime. If you notice, if you look at uh, any charts that deals with criminal behavior, you'll notice between the ages of 24 and 38 is the time that most people commit crimes. When people uh, begin to turn after four decades, around 40 years old, you see that we call that the aging out of crime. People, they uh, commit much less crime after the age of 40, okay? Crime variables help researchers uh, to understand, predict, and explain criminal behavior, okay? And like I said recently, the variables that we're gonna talk about is uh, economics, uh, we're going to talk about genetics, and we're going to talk about how the environment actually induces, a lot of time, people to commit criminal behavior. And based on my research, these three variables, in my opinion, are the three greatest predictors of whether or not a person will engage in criminal activities. Okay? Before we talk about the, the three variables, let's look at the crime picture in the United States. Right now, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, in the United States, right now we have six million, I didn't say 600,000, six million, 851 people who are under some form of adult correction supervision. Six million, 851,000 people in the United States. As a matter of fact, one in every 36 adults in the United States are under some form of correctional supervision, okay? The United States has the world's highest prison population rate, which is 724 people per 100,000. That means that for every 100,000 people in the United States, 724 of them are locked up in prison, okay? When we look at the blacks, African Americans, in the United States. Now keep in mind, 724 per 100,000. But when we look at African Americans' rate of imprisonment in the United States, for every 100,000 African Americans in the United States, 4,347 of them are locked up in prison, okay? When we look at whites in the United States, that number is actually 678 which means that for every 100,000 whites in the United States, 678 of them are locked up compared to 4,347 for the African American, okay? In the United States, it costs us $70 billion a year to incarcerate people in the United States, 70 billion. And take a guess who pays for this? We do, taxpayers, 70 billion dollars per year to keep people incarcerated. Well, before I go there, there's one more uh, statistic. African American youth, our African American youth are five times more likely to be confined than their white peers and are locked up at a rate of 605 per 100,000. Okay, that's 600 for every 100,000 African American youth in the United States, 605 of them are locked up compared to, for every 100,000 Caucasians, white youth, you have 127. Now that is a very different number here, 127 to 605. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about, like I say, we only have seven slides, and right now we're on slide three or four. So let's look at the environment. How does the environment impact crime? in the United States. And I'm looking at the United States, but listen, 
this is not just for the United States. If you look at countries, industrialized countries throughout the world, this variable will basically stay steady, okay? Structured, structured environments. When I say structured environments, I'm talking about it. Do y'all know that? We take it for granted sometimes, but there are actually some households where you may not find five or ten books in the house, okay? They don't read to their kids. They don't support education. So in a structured environment, these are environments where books are readily available, okay? You have educational activities. The parents, whether it's a one parent or two family household, two parent family household, they're able to support uh, their young ones as they come home with homework. It's, they are very nurturing. They have guardians in the home who actually support the educational activity of the children. When I talk about structured environments, I'm also talking about these are people who have choices as to what types of food they will feed to their children. Some people may not believe this, but your nutrition has a lot to do, a lot of time, with your learning ability and your behavior. As a matter of fact, if a kid goes to school and drinks a lot of, not, not to school, just in their own home, if you drink a lot of red pop with a lot of artificial uh, sweeteners and things in it, it causes some kids to get real hyper. And hyperactivity sometimes is correlated with why some kids are actually diagnosed as ADD and ADHD. Sometimes it's a lot, it has a lot to do with their diet. But in structured environments, kids don't eat very many sugary products, okay? Early childhood learning centers. I said to the other class in Intro to Criminal Justice, one of the major differences between underprivileged youth and privileged youth, I'm talking about middle class and upper middle class, and what we call lower class or people who live in poverty, one of the major differences when it comes to crime is education. And the reason I say that is because a lot of times when parents don't have the means, they do not send their children to early childhood development centers, okay? Now y'all think about this for a minute. According to the statistics, if a kid is in the second grade and they're behaving poorly academically and behaviorally, a lot of times that's what we call the school to prison pipeline. That is the route that they take because at second grade, a lot of times many states determine how many prison beds they're going to be, that's right, how many prison bays they're going to have need in the next so many years, 12, 10, 12, 15 years, based on how those children are performing in the second grade. Because we know that if you're performing poorly academically and behaviorally in the second grade, many times, by the time you read the seventh or eighth grade, you've already come into contact with the juvenile justice center. And many times, those people either uh, drop out of school or they continue on in trouble and they end up in the adult prison systems, okay? <clears throat> we talk about this unstructured environments when we talk about environments because in un un unstructured environments, we're talking about impoverished environments where there's a lack of medical and dental attention for the children a lot of time. Uh, they have limited choices of food. They're in houses where there's lead paint, okay? Many people may not understand, but lead paint has a lot to do with how children learn, okay? Lead paint, and that's why the government and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, their own people a lot of times, if you have older houses that have lead paint in it, they, if they find out about it, they'll make the landowner do something to correct that because as children grow up in those houses, it does something to their brains or their mental capacities, okay? All right, also, kids who grow up in unstructured environments, they are, uh, they have limited access to medical treatment and prenatal care as far as the parents are concerned. They live in areas where there are dilapidated houses, broken down cars. Most of you that are criminal justice majors, you know about the broken windows theory. The broken windows theory say that when you're living in an, in, an environment where people let their grass grow tall, they have parked, broke cars that they never fixed, 
the windows are broken sometimes in their houses and they don't get it fixed. It makes people believe that people don't care about their communities. Okay? And crime seems to uh, be rampant in those type of neighborhoods. Okay? Also, think about kids growing up in unstructured environments or impoverished environments and what they see a lot of times on a daily basis. Pawn shops, liquor stores, prostitution. I want y'all to think about gated communities. Okay, and think about the contrast between what you find in impoverished neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are gated communities or where there's upper middle class people, okay? They don't have a lot of those things. You have to drive a distance to find a lot of what we're talking about here. You know, liquor stores, you don't see prostitutes walking a lot of time in gated communities or around, or around in those areas. Drug trafficking. Y'all remember in the 80s and when crack cocaine first came out, back in the late, what, 70s, early 80s? People would run to your car. 10 and 12 people, all of them trying to get you to buy some rock cocaine or whatever, crack cocaine, trying to get you to buy those things. You don't see that in upper middle class neighborhoods, okay? But parents a lot of times also have low educational abilities. They themselves cannot help their younger kids with their homework, okay? And that's also a problem that leads to a lot of times kids getting frustrated at the school. Uh, and a lot of times that leads to problems, a disciplinary problems with the kid. And then you have what they call one-parent households. I, I hate to say this, but it's the truth. In America today, among African-American households, about 70% of African-American households are female-headed households. There's only one parent, okay, in that house, okay, and that, that has also something to do with children being locked up in youth facilities. Because one of the things that judges say, judges will say to our youth when they get in trouble, they say, if your mother is at work in the afternoon, who's going to take care of you or supervise you when you get out of school. If they don't have anyone there to supervise them, a lot of times they will that's a reason for them to lock them up and incarcerate our young people, okay? All right. Economics. We know that this is really the major this is the major variable for us economics and that's why we call it enviral echo genetics. In the middle of all this, okay, is economics. Because your economic status will a lot of times determine your what? Environmental status. Okay? Economics and environmental status goes hand in hand. Most researchers have long held that poverty breeds crime. Criminal justice folk, we know that. Poverty. And, and the way that we prove that, according to criminologists, there's a very strong correlation between poverty and crime. Crime mapping. Most po major police departments have what they call crime mapping. And crime mapping is when the police departments take an aerial picture of a city or let's just say Marshall, Texas. They take an aerial picture of it. And every time a crime is committed, a burglary, a murder, a rape, a robbery, they actually map it. They put a, a, a pin there. And what we've noticed with crime mapping is that the majority of crimes well, we're going to say street crime, because also keep in mind, folks, there are two types of crime. You have street crimes, and you have sweet crimes, okay? S-U-I-T-E, okay? S-U-I-T-E, sweet, crimes in the sweet. But we're talking about crimes in the street, and when you look at street crime, most of those crimes take place in impoverished or low-income areas. No one will argue that, okay? According, now, this was pretty mind-boggling to me. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, an uh, inmate survey that they did, 45% of prisoners, 45% of prisoners were unemployed at the time that they were arrested. That means they what? When you turn it over, 55% of them were employed at the time that they were arrested. But what they did not account for is unemployed or under employed. See, you can be employed, but if you're only working one day a week, we call that underemployment, okay? The, the research didn't take into account as to whether or not they were underemployed, okay? 
55% of those people that were arrested or yeah, arrested were never married. That was a strong statistic for me also. But now, I want you to think about these states right here. What do you notice about each one of these states? Vermont, Maine, Virginia, Utah, Idaho, Montana. These are, and this is recent research, 2014. These states are among the safest states for people to live in in the United States. The safest. Vermont. Do you know what percentage of black folk live in Vermont? <laughs> okay, y'all getting the best. Okay, now Virginia has a, 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 I don't know what the percentage is, but a much higher percent than most of these other states. But less than 1% of residents in Vermont and Maine are black folk. And probably you can say the same thing for Montana, okay? Uh, I don't know about Idaho and Utah, but I know they are very low uh, percentages of African Americans there. And I'm not saying every state African Americans go to that, you know, it's, it's unsafe. But I am saying according to the research, these are the safest states to stay in. And there's a reason for it. Each state here has something in common. The educational level of their residents, they have about 60% of their residents have bachelor degrees. Okay, I'm not talking about high school diplomas. They have bachelor degrees and their income is high. The only state that didn't have a pretty high income was Montana. And the reason that they don't have a high income is because they have a lot of Native Americans in Montana. But for the most part, all of these states they have something that is very similar in common, and that is the educational levels of their people and the amount of money that they make. We know that as your income increases, crime, what? Decreases. decreases. As your education increases, crime also, what? Decreases also, and this is a fact, okay? Now, this is the one that a lot of people, my students and all, they say, Dr. Andrew, do you believe that a person Genetic have anything to do with whether or not they're going to uh, commit a crime? Genetics. We're born with genetics. We get our genetics from our mothers, fathers, okay? So that's something that we don't have any control over, our genetics. But I want to explain to you. I am not supporting the claim that Cesar Lombroso made when he said that some people are atavistic. And atavistic means that they're not fully formed as human beings, that activistic means that you are, you are like a throwback, okay? Like you, you, some of you have seen the progression chart of the Cro-Magnum man and the ape and how they come to evolve into a human being. Well, Cesar Lombroso believed that some people were activistic, that they were not fully formed yet, and he believed that they were born with criminal genes and that it did, it did not matter, they would eventually become Criminals. He called them born criminals, okay? Early theories that uh, we're not going to go over it because that's basically what I just said to you. But now, there's a gentleman by the name of Richard Dugdale. Richard Dugdale was a sociologist who actually did a study on a group of people called the Jukes, J U K E S. Some of you read that's very interesting. The Jukes had a very, he noticed one thing. He went down to the jail and he found out that. There were about 27 people locked up in this particular jail in this small town, and all of them had the same last name, Jukes. And he started saying, why are so many of them locked up? And when he started really doing research on the family, he found out that about probably 50% of the members of that clan, that family, all of them ended up in jail. They had brothel houses, they were prostitutes, murderers. I mean, the whole family, the Jukes, all had some problems. So he, that supported Cesar Lombroso's claim that some people had, what, criminal genes, okay? But in my current theory, my inclusion of genetics as a variable that predisposes people to a great extent to commit crime comes in a different way. I don't, I don't know if some of you may be able to relate to this, some of you may and some of you may not. But have you ever noticed that sometimes when a father had a, a, have a quick temper, sometimes the children may end up with a quick temper? That's genetics, okay? When I look at genetics, 
sometimes a father may drink alcohol a lot, may be an alcoholic. That gene is passed down a lot of times to the children and it predisposes them to a great extent to become alcoholics, okay? That's the kind of genetics that I look at, okay? Genetics that will say, not that you are a born criminal, but there are some things about you that predisposes you to a greater extent to engage in certain things. By the way, genes, let, we know that genetics is, is true. If we know that genetics and the way it affects us is true because even people who have parents or grandparents who've had breast cancer, mm -hmm. they are in a high risk category of what? Yeah, I have breast cancer because they have a gene in them that predisposes them. So, alcoholics, people who have quick tempers, all of this, in my opinion, uh, and even now, y'all know for those of us that 50 years old or older, when we came through school, Mr. Derek Reed, there was no such thing as ADD, ADHD. We didn't have no ADD or no ADHD. All we had was BAD. <laughs> and you was bad. That's it. And they had something to work with us to get us back, to whip us back in shape, okay? But the genetic traits that I talk about actually are genetic traits that deals with people's temper or deals with uh, their predisposition to alcoholism or even being diagnosed as ADD or ADHD. Okay, those are the ones that I look at when we come to genetics. Okay, and then I, in conclusion, in conclusion, uh, as reflected in this presentation, education, okay, employment, consistent discipline, okay, that's another thing that we sometimes don't do, especially in, in uh, environments that are unstructured. We don't. We might let our kid get away. We, you know, I think my parents did the same thing. And every now and then they'll tell you, "Now you do that again, I'm gonna whip you. You do it again, I'm gonna whip you." But we have to be consistent in our di in our discipline. Okay, uh, our environments, economic stability, and family genes are all contributing factors to criminal behavior or the lack thereof. Okay, if we do what we're supposed to do as far as our kids are concerned, and educate them. For the first four years of most of our children's lives, those kids that are born in poverty or impoverished neighborhoods, for the first four years of their life, they are at home with grandma, cousin, uncle, and their responsibility is to do what? To feed the kid and to keep them dry. They don't teach them their ABCs, they don't count to them a lot of times, they don't know their numbers. So listen, there's a, a, 